You're listening to 360 Digital, a podcast brought to you by Mopinion's all-in-one user feedback software. This podcast series tackles a number of different topics under the digital umbrella, from best practices in UX and CRO to the latest trends and innovations in customer experience and digital marketing. This is 360 Digital. Hi, everyone. My name is Erin Gilliam, and welcome to episode number four of the new podcast series, 360 Digital. As many of you already know, uh, last month we sat down with retail expert Vainan Jiongan to talk about the latest movements in the retail industry. During this episode, uh, Vainan gave us the inside scoop on basically what's happening within this industry as a result of the pandemic and where it's headed. Um, He had some really interesting insights and practical advice for retailers that are, you know, in the process of digitizing their strategies. So for all my retailers out there, if you haven't listened yet, please be sure to download this episode and hear what he has to say. And today we're diving into a completely different industry, um, one of which many of you have probably been involved in in one way or another, uh, whether that was in a school, uh, part of your mandatory business training or full distance learning course. Um, Today we're going to talk about e-learning. Now, many would say that the pandemic has thrusted the e-learning industry forward, with so many schools adopting this way of learning due to lockdowns and school closures, what have you. But actually, there was already a tremendous amount of growth happening in the industry even prior to the pandemic. In fact, according to the World Economic Forum, global edtech investments reached 18.6 billion U.S. dollars in 2019. And the overall market for the online education sector is projected to reach 350 billion by 2025. That's huge. So with so much success, we thought it'd be interesting to dive a bit deeper and see what kinds of digital strategies these platforms are working with and how they leverage those strategies for long-term success. In this episode, we will tackle this topic with the help of a marketing professional who's actually active in the e-learning industry. Today's guest speaker is the marketing manager at Drillster. She's also a regular writer for marketing blogs like the Dutch websites Marketing Facts and Frank Watching. So without further ado, let's give a warm welcome to today's special guest, Tessie Wustenberg. Hi, Tessie. Hi. (laughs) Hi, Erin. Thank you for having me. I'm happy to join. Yeah, of course. Well, thanks for taking the time out of your busy schedule to chat with us today. Um, perhaps you can tell us a little bit more about yourself, uh, your background in e-learning and may- maybe also your role at Drillster. Yeah, of course. Um, yeah, as you, uh, as you were saying, I'm marketing manager at Drillster, uh, and there I'm responsible for developing and implementing the marketing strategy for Drillster. Uh, so by analyzing the market, the industry and effectiveness of different tools, I develop a marketing strategy to position Drillster in the best possible way, um, to reach both, uh, both potential and existing clients. Uh, ultimately to help co- companies with developing, retaining, and anchoring crucial knowledge to improve business effectiveness, quality, and safety, but also to reduce risks and costs. Great. So you've got a lot of knowledge on the matter, I think. Um, I hope so. <laughs> well, again, thanks for joining us today. Um, so before we get started, we always like to break the ice with our guests. Um, so we have a quick question for you. Are you ready for it? Uh, yeah. Hit me. <laughs> Icebreaker. All right. Well, seeing as how you work for an e-learning company, um, I'm sure you've completed plenty of e-learning courses yourself. So our question is, what was the last non-work-related course that you've completed? The non-work-related course. Ouch. (laughs) Think back. Uh, uh, Well, the first thing that comes to mind, um, well, you could actually, I think you could argue whether it's work-related because it was an in-company first aid course. Um, Okay. So that's mandatory for someone, at least one person in your company to have. So I guess it's work related. Um, But it's all about, um, yeah, first aid. So what to do when someone uh, falls ill uh, at one point during the day. So how do you how do you help people? How do you make sure that you contact the right people um, and to make sure that you take the right steps? Yeah. uh, In order. yeah, to, to help people, I guess. So uh, is that work-related? Yes, I know. <laughs> yeah, it's always so good for your private life, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Now it's um, it's uh, good information to have for sure. It includes CPR and how to how to evacuate and also what to do when someone has a burn. So it's uh, it's always nice to know. Yeah, pretty serious stuff. <laughs> mm-hmm. Great. All right. Um, well, now that we've broken the ice, um, 
<laughs> Maybe you can start off by telling us a little bit about um, the e-learning industries, e -learning industry. Sorry. So, for example, um, yeah, who uses these platforms? How are they used? And what really makes them so great? Of course. Um, yeah, well, the e-learning industry is quite big, uh, probably bigger than you would think, at least if you're... Um, if your mind immediately, immediately goes to schools, universities, or education as a whole, um, which is true, of course, but uh, learning is done by everyone all the time. Uh, as you said in your intro, um, when you decide for yourself to do a training or a course, um, you can do e-learning, but also when you have to do an e-learning because of strict job requirements. And then you can think of compliance awareness, safety training, onboarding, or privacy protocols, but also in-company first aid training. Um, that being said, e-learning is quite a, a, a generic term because it basically means electronic learning. And this would mean that every piece of content for learning purposes that is digital uh, is e-learning. But over time, over the last um, years, e-learning is used to refer to the e-learning modules that everyone has probably seen once in his life. So the actual modules that are used to help people learn. Um, uh, However, there, there's a big downside to the traditional e-learning, if, if I can say, uh, if I can mention it as traditional. Uh, it's usually a one-time thing. So people click through a module and they might read it, they might not. Uh, get a check mark probably that they've um, run, run through the entire course, uh, entire course and then they are done. And this usually leads to a temporary peak of knowledge. And that knowledge fades away almost immediately after finishing uh, a certain module. Uh, so therefore, there are a bunch of elements that are implemented into e-learning tools that aim to tackle this problem and assure a more effective, um, more effective learning effect. So think of adaptiveness, microlearning, continuous learning, assessment-based, gamification, whatnot. Um, and talking about strictly Drillster, that, that's a question-based adaptive microlearning tool that uh, calculates when knowledge declines and then reminds individual users to brush up on their knowledge. So continuous learning tailored to the individual. And that way we make sure that users know, understand, um, and remind and are able to apply knowledge on the job. That's much more efficient and effective. But the industry as a whole, coming back to your first question, is um, uh, very big and growing for sure. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting that you say that because I, I was thinking back um, just a personal story that I was uh, trying to learn French on Duolingo. That's the mm -hmm. that language e-learning app. And yeah. I had the same thing, actually, that it wasn't this uh, continuous learning thing, but it was really, yeah, you go over something and then it was kind of over and then you move on to the next module, but it doesn't ever go back to those old, uh, yeah, segments that you learned about. So it's really interesting that you say that, that it's like ongoing. Yeah, that's a very familiar uh, problem. Like, I have never used uh, Duolingo myself, but we see these uh, issues arise in almost every company, especially for... Uh, let's say a topic like compliance. So everyone has to do a compliance training, compliance awareness training. You either go to a face-to-face -face training, uh, click through an e-learning, maybe read a PDF, um, and then you get a check mark, and then you're done for that year or two years. So on paper, you're compliant. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, I don't know about you, but if I have to uh, if I have to study for a test and I do that the night before, I probably pass that test. But then everything. All the knowledge is gone after two days, probably. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, I know exactly so what you mean. For life. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what people probably still do. And therefore, you are never really compliant. And there must be an element of continuous uh, learning and uh, brushing up on knowledge and awareness to make sure that everyone knows what they're supposed to know and yep. you know what to do and how to act um, with the right knowledge at the right time. Yeah. Yeah, it's good that you mentioned those ISO regulations because that was actually that kind of leads me to my next question. Um, uh, yeah, we're in the middle of a pandemic. That's uh, n not news to anyone. Um, but that might have some sort of an effect on these types of platforms because everyone's having to learn things online. Uh, and yeah, you know, processes like um, onboarding and things like that, or, you know, also uh, freshening up your knowledge about ISO regulations. Um, are those things that have changed since the pandemic or is that more or less the same? You mean the way people learn? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, we have seen some shifts indeed uh, over the last year of pandemic. 
Uh, what is interesting is that at first uh, we saw that companies were delaying everything. So everyone was holding their horses, waiting for things to go back to normal. And uh, when that took so long, schools and companies started to do things digitally, uh, probably in a quick and dirty kind of way. So hosting a webinar instead of a face-to-face -face training, for example. Uh, but as we all know right now, uh, things will not go back to normal anytime soon, if it will ever again. Uh, so what we see happening right now is that people are starting to realize that they need a different solution, uh, something that is more effective and more sustainable, uh, something that can keep, uh, they can keep using for the next period of time. So eventually they, uh, they will come to e-learning tools. Yeah. And that's also, you mentioned this briefly, but, um, you know, lots more schools are starting to use these platforms. Is there any change in how you can uh, cater to those types of users? Because I can imagine for some companies that are focused on business learning, um, that that's a bit mm -hmm. of a switch, you know, to have to go towards, you know, students. Yeah. Yeah, I think the purposes are different because especially for uh, schools and the younger students, it's also very important to have them uh, in sight, I, I guess, on a daily basis. So have your classroom together because the social aspect is also a big one for schools. So it makes sense to me that they uh, use tools like um, uh, Teams or Hangouts to just be in touch uh, with, yeah, and also have the sight of each other uh, the entire day. So there has been an increase in using learning tools in uh, schools and education. Uh, then again, I doubt that that will that that will stay because just going to school and interacting with uh, with other children and your friends that's um, that's a big part of of school next to the learning itself. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Very much different. Um, okay, um, and then I have another question for you. Um, so, as an e-learning platform provider, uh, you're typically dealing with more than one user. Um, and maybe that's not always the case, but uh, you have the ones that are utilizing your platform. So the people that are creating a course using your modules, um, but you also have the learners. So I can imagine this brings on uh, several different challenges for you. So I'm curious, um, what are some struggles that e-learning platforms encounter on a day-to-day -day basis? Um, well, several things come to mind. Uh, what comes to mind at first is that uh, developing learning content is a profession. Uh, it is very hard to create and have it being correct didactically, I guess. Um, so depending on the type of e-learning that you use, there are things to keep in mind while creating for the end user. And in the case of um, uh, Drillster, that is assessment based. That means that uh, you let people learn while answering questions. Therefore, you'll have to take your information and turn it into questions and feedback. And um, we, uh, as Drillster, uh, facilitate the platform. So we don't create content ourselves, but we provide the, uh, the tool, the app, and the content creators of our clients, they make sure that the content is converted into, uh, into drills. So uh, we deal with uh, people who decide to use the tool. We deal with people who create the learning content, and uh, we deal with the end users. Uh, but um, uh, mostly the people who create the learning content, uh, they, they use Drillster to create the content and the end users just have the app to answer their drill questions. Um, and talking about um, uh, feedback, of course, uh, when having these different stakeholders and different types of target groups is, um, yeah, because we do not create the learning content, uh, the feedback that end users have on that content, maybe if there's a typo, there's something wrong, there's something uh, should be a little different, they sometimes come to us, whereas they, ideally they should be going to the person creating the content. So the person within their organization yeah. instead of coming to us. Uh, that being said, I think it's always good to be receptive of any type of, uh, of feedback. So whether that is um, of the person who decides on a learning tool, the person who creates learning content, or the end user who has to use the platform to get better and smarter. Because eventually every type of, of feedback that you get um, will make your product better. And that's better for, for everyone. That's better for us. That's better for the users and for the people um, who are dealing uh, with it on a daily basis. Yeah. So win-win. Yeah. Yeah. Um Maybe you can also talk about, I mean, obviously, uh, you have to kind of keep your users 
interactive with uh, with e-learning, and this might also this might be something to do with in, in the case of Drillster, um, your customers because they're the ones creating the content. But um, maybe you can discuss the role uh, interactivity plays in e-learning. So, what motivates someone to do an e-learning, and are there any fun elements incorporated into e-learning that make it more engaging? Mm -hmm. Well, learning is always fun, of course. <laughs> uh, no. Um, uh, yeah, for sure. There's a there's a bunch of things you can do to make it at least more fun. Because um, uh, in the end, most people who have to do an, an e-learning who did not choose to do an e-learning, um, it's uh, it's it's probably something that they're treading at least at first. Um, and there's uh, a lot of ways to to make it to make it more fun. And uh, the most important thing is that you. Um, Take your target group in mind. So you create content that is useful and understandable and relatable for the target group that you have in mind. So if you work at a, let's say, uh, a big bank and you have um, you have learning modules, you have to create different learning modules for the accountants than for the people at the service desk, for example. Yeah. Because uh, those who talk <laughs> talk a different language, so you need to to keep in mind that there's a different target group to make it more interesting, more relatable, and more fun. Um, and when you want to um, uh, really make it uh, more fun and make it more like a, a game, uh, then you can implement gamification. And gamification is a term used to have uh, game elements implemented in your learning modules. Um, but it, you can call something gamification quite quickly, and that's um, that's something to keep in mind because uh, as soon as you have an avatar, so as you have um, a little uh, a picture, a puppet thingy that represents you, then it, that can be uh, an element of gamification. Also, if you have a score or when you can level up, uh, that that are ways or that are elements of gamification. So you can call something gamification quite quickly, whereas right? it's not gamification, uh, oh, it, it is not gamification fully. Um, so if you have uh, ways to, to trump, your, trump your, um, your colleagues or your boss and to make sure that you level up first or you're better or faster or have, more, have a better score, that is something um, that refers more to gamification. So leaderboards, uh, those are interesting elements. Yeah. Uh, in the end, I do think it needs to serve a purpose because when you're just trying to beat your boss or your colleague just, just for beating them, for the single purpose of beating them, that will get you to use your learning module. But um, in the end, the target is to have someone learn and take uh, take uh, knowledge and information and anchor that knowledge and make sure that he performs better on the job. And if you just want to have people uh, fun and interact, it's better to, um, to have a ping pong table <laughs> at your company probably and uh, do the lear have learning modules uh, to what a purpose is for. So I think you need to be careful in what you what you want to implement in terms of uh, gamification elements, because in the end, you want to reach a goal, and uh, the goal should be that people will be smarter and better at their job. Yeah, and not let people get too competitive about it. <laughs> you have yeah, to exactly. People. It's a very good way. yeah, it's a very good way to make it make it fun and interactive, but. Uh, if that's the only purpose that it serves, I, I doubt that that's the right way to yeah, go. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and in terms of, uh, yeah, a lot of e-learning devices or e-learning platforms are used on multiple devices, you could say. So mm -hmm. uh, what are some of the most important aspects of an e-learning platform from a digital perspective? So those devices I mentioned, but also um, the design and maybe the speed, so internet speed, depending on where they are, those kind of things. Uh, yeah, well, the most um, logical ones are probably desktop, tablet, and phone. Um, personally, I like to to use my e-learning modules on my laptop, but um, uh, mobile phone is gaining ground for sure. Uh, and when you have something that uh, can run on multiple devices, it's always good to um, to tailor your content to the phone, probably. So if you have something that can be done on your phone, both on your phone and on your laptop, 
uh, it will look good on your laptop and not on your phone, but the other way around does work. So if you want something on multiple devices, make sure that you tailor it to your phone and then, uh, then it will be good. Uh, but um, I, do, I do think it is important to either do it or uh, have it on your roadmap somewhere to make sure that people can do it on their mobile phones because eventually that's where they spend most of their time probably. Yeah. Um, and it's good to be where they are. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, now we're going to move on to the next segment of our podcast. Um, that is our social media moment. Social media moment. So EdTech at UTRGV, um, which is offers a undergraduate master's and doctoral program certificates in educational technology. Uh, they recently tweeted about the four ways to create an effective M learning strategy. So mobile learning. Um, which we just went over. Mm-hmm. Um, in the article, they go on to talk about how chief learning officers, learning leaders, and training coordinators everywhere are well aware of the need to increase mobile training programs. In fact, uh, they say that 74% of employees say they access resources from their smartphones to their jobs, and that this is you know, a growing number. Um, so our question for you is, uh, and maybe you went over this a little bit already, um, but what about mobile? How is this channel different in terms of your approach to user experience and really keeping users satisfied with the channel? Uh, yeah, that is, a good, that is a good question. And I, ha- I haven't heard, uh, hadn't heard about this research, um, but it makes, to- it makes total sense to me. Because what I was um, just saying, like people are on their phones 24 seven, if they if they need help, if they need something, whatever it is, they will turn to their phone. Uh, so it makes total sense to be uh, where your target group is. So uh, uh, it's very good to have have an app and make sure that people can learn um, with their phones because that's something that they they know and it's easy for them. Um, uh, with that in mind, uh, yeah. What I also told before, it's good to to make sure that your content works on a phone because it's uh, something you create for your laptop does not work on your phone necessarily. So keep that in mind for sure. Um, and what I also think uh, is that it, it fits very well into the busy lives that we lead nowadays. So we don't want to uh, sit down and do an e-learning. We want to do it quick and easy and in between things. So while waiting for the bus maybe, or even at uh, the coffee machine or whatever these little moments um, that are now lost, you can fill those up with um, quick and easy learning bites, um, something we call micro learning. So micro learning is a, is a good way to uh, chunk up uh, your learning modules into uh, little pieces. And that makes sure um, with that, you make sure that people do not start cramming uh, one night for the test the next day, like we were talking bef- uh, yeah. about before. And also to make sure that they repeat it more often. So you do like 15 minutes uh, today, 15 minutes tomorrow and uh, the rest of the week instead of uh, one giant session in which you you probably lost your mind halfway anyways. Um, so I think that's an effective uh, learning methodology and that um, combines well with uh, mobile learning because that's something that you can do quick and easy where and wherever you are. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's also an easier way of remembering things, too, um, if you do them in small bits and pieces rather than one whole, uh, you know, training at once. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Well, you probably saw this question coming. Um, uh, let's quickly discuss the the future in a post-COVID world. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's uh, will, we, will we keep learning online, do you expect? And uh, if so, will the amount of e-learners, you know, increase a lot or... What do you think will happen there? I think uh, what I think will happen or what I hope will happen. <laughs> Let's go with what you hope will happen. <laughs> uh, okay. Well, it, it's, um, it's the same, really, because um, I do think uh, uh, online learning, uh, e-learning, mobile learning is here to stay for sure. So it, it must have accelerated uh, over the last year because people had to. They had to digitize. Uh, and you have to find different ways of learning, um, but also because it just makes sense in the current era. Um, uh, so I definitely think it will stay and it will increase. However, if 
every time you have to learn something, you have to do a course or a training or learn something new, do onboarding, uh, whatever, and you get an e-learning module, you'll get an overkill real soon. <laughs> it's my, yeah. it's uh, uh, I expect to happen because you don't want to do these things constantly. Sometimes you just want to want to sit down and um, look at a video or hear someone explaining to you uh, how something works or have you do it practice. Um, so I think um, if you combine all of those into a, like a blending a blended learning situation. Uh, that will be very effective. So uh, combine online learning with offline learning and, and uh, just combine all kinds of, of different ways. So, so leading, um, reading, listening, uh, doing, uh, the, the more that you combine, the better it is for the learning effect. So the, the more you combine, the more you will actually learn. And do you think that that amount of growth that you mentioned before, do you think that'll be primarily for bis- the business sector? Or do you think uh, they'll also be doing that in schools as well? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, it's hard to look ahead. Um, I, g- I guess that would make sense if that is more digital as well, especially um for uh universities or at least uh when you're a little further along in yeah. life um i think that's uh that we will see that more for sure and it will provide people with the opportunity to follow more classes or do more or do another study in another university maybe or in another place yeah. um when you don't have to physically go yeah. there yeah or in any case maybe like you said do some sort of combination of e-learning and then also uh in yeah, school exactly. yeah okay um well i think that pretty much covers it for today um but before we go we always like to give our guests a moment uh to share any last bits of advice they have for our listeners so i'll give you the floor here um are there any takeaways you'd like to leave our audience with today yeah i think uh no matter uh what you do what you use uh, so what kind of methodology you're learning offline or uh, micro learning adaptive learning assessment based uh, whatever you do, just make sure that you do not just send information. Make sure that you anchor knowledge. So that it does not stop at reading, listening, whatever, and having uh, have people to be able to reproduce this information, but make sure that people also know what to do with that information. So how to apply the knowledge on the job at the right time. I think um, if, if you just send information uh, that has that has hardly any value. People need to convert that uh, information into knowledge, make sure that they can, that they retain it, that they anchor it, and that they know what to do with information. And that applies for all types of, uh, of learning. And um, also, what I told you before, it's very important to tailor the course materials or the learning material to the various target groups within, within a school or organization. Because generic learning content is um, hardly ever an effective approach to learning. And you see that uh, there is much off the shelf content uh, that's generic, that's, yeah, that's often generic and that does not really fulfill its duty, as well as unique content that is tailored to the individual need or to the need of a smaller target group. Um, so even if you just make a test or an educational video or have a poster designed or whatever, <laughs> whatever you can come up with, to facilitate learning, just keep the target group in mind and make sure that they uh, get what is important and recognizable for them, and then make sure that it sticks yeah. somehow, so that it's not just a, a one-off, one-off learning module, but that they uh, can retain the information and know what to do with it afterwards. That's much more useful, more effective, more efficient, and more yeah. fun for it. Yeah, agreed. That's that's what you're doing it for in the first place. So that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, great advice. Um, Yeah, we want to thank you again for your time and for joining us on the show today. That's it for today's podcast. Uh, Hopefully this has given all of our listeners a bit of insight into this unique industry and where it's headed. Thanks for joining. We hope you've enjoyed today's episode and we're looking forward to bringing you much more exciting content here on 360 Digital. Thanks for listening and be sure to tune in for a brand new episode next month.